our guest today is the President and Chief Program Officer for Teach for America. He leads the effort to attract extraordinary talent into the hardest to staff, highest need schools. Our guest today has a full-time staff of over 900. This year, Teach for America's applicants included 13% of seniors at Notre Dame, 11% of seniors at Yale, 9% of seniors at Harvard and Princeton, and 8% of seniors at Northwestern. 95% of Teach for America's applicants are non-education majors. That is worth a round of applause. So all you lawyers, step up. <laughs> Our guest today graduated from Harvard in 1998 and was business manager of the Harvard Crimson. He then served seven years at McKinsey where he became the youngest partner in the firm's history. Our guest today lives in Minneapolis with his wife and 19-month-old baby daughter. Ladies and gentlemen, the President and Chief Program Officer for Teach for America, Matt Kramer. Matt. Thank you so much. Uh, thank, thank you all. parents uh, of Teach for America Corps members in the room uh, and thank you all for the support that you give to the folks who are doing this absolutely uh, critical work. Um, to several of our board members who are in the room and in particular Paul Finnegan, our chair of our uh, Chicago uh, Teach for America board. Uh, and, and for all of you uh, for coming today. Um, I'm going to talk for not that long and then let you all fire questions at me and I'm happy to take uh, whatever the hardest questions on your mind are um, about uh, education and education reform and Teach for America. Uh, but just maybe to start out, uh, I want to talk a little bit about the problem that we are seeking to uh, address at Teach for America. Uh, and that is, uh, and, and you all may have heard these statistics at some level, they're uh, you know, growing to be a uh, a, a soft chorus in the background, I think, in our society, but that on average in low-income communities, uh, nine-year-olds are already three grade levels behind in terms of their academic achievement uh, of nine-year-olds in more affluent communities. It's sort of a shocking thing to think about, uh, uh, really, that uh, by nine years old, uh, the expectation uh, uh, is in affluent communities that kids can read uh, chapter books and that they are uh, pretty fluent in, uh, in arithmetic uh, and that the expectation in low-income communities uh, is that uh, nine-year-olds are reading books like uh, about run, spot, run uh, and that they have almost no fluency uh, in uh, basic math skills. And so for the 13 million kids growing up in poverty today, about half won't graduate from high school. Uh, and again, you know, perhaps even more shockingly, uh, of the half that do graduate uh, uh, from high school, they will on average perform at an eighth grade level, uh, uh, which means even the graduates are four years uh, behind their more affluent peers. Overall, about one in 10 uh, of the kids growing up in low-income communities today will end up graduating from college. And my view uh, is that uh, in a world where education is the fundamental uh, gateway to opportunity, that your, your choices in life are uh, in many ways determined by the uh, educational uh, opportunities you get, uh, and where for the 13 million kids growing up in uh, low-income communities today, uh, where they're born more than anything else determines the opportunities that they have in life. Uh, that that is failing our most fundamental obligations to democracy. That, that it is, it's hard to imagine anything more unfair and unjust uh, than a country that, is, uh, that gives opportunities to people uh, who are educated and that where education is not uh, distributed equally. Uh, so I, I, I think that backdrop uh, is the challenge we uh, come to work uh, 
to work on every day is this challenge of fundamental inequity in the distribution and access to education. I think it's also worth spending a second uh, thinking about why we have this problem. Because um, I think maybe this is one of the uh, questions that we uh, get a lot. And I think w how you understand the nature of the problem has a lot to do with how you go about solving it. Um, so let me just give the sort of my view of, of how we ended up in this situation. Uh, and no doubt you all coming at it from lots of different perspectives will have similar and different thoughts on this. And I'd be, be happy to talk about those. Uh, but first is obviously poverty creates lots of challenges uh, for kids in schools. Uh, it is a challenge to come to school in the morning uh, if you haven't eaten breakfast uh, because your family can't afford it. Uh, and it makes it hard to concentrate on the schoolwork. It is a challenge if you don't have adequate health care uh, and therefore you come to school with a uh, toothache that shouldn't be seen by a dentist, but instead goes untreated and so you come to school focusing on pain instead of focusing on school. It's a challenge to not have a quiet place to do homework at night. It's a challenge to have parents who themselves uh, did not achieve high levels of education and therefore aren't able to do the work that you're supposed to do and therefore aren't able to help you with that work. At every level, uh, being poor uh, is an incredible disadvantage. Uh, for succeeding in the educational system we have. Uh, and the second thing, and I think what's, what's important to note about this is the schools we have in so many ways were not designed to solve that problem. Uh, not every school, not every classroom, et cetera, but on the whole, the school system we have was designed to solve a different problem. It was designed to solve the problem of how to take middle class kids and uh, create a common foundation of democracy uh, and you know expose them to the right things so that they would over time uh, have the opportunity to become educated people. It wasn't designed to solve this problem of nine year old kids coming into school uh, who are three grade levels behind the more affluent peers. It wasn't designed to solve the problem of how to catch kids up who are far behind uh, against the incredible odds of poverty. And so I think that we have a system that doesn't solve this problem uh, shouldn't surprise us uh, when that's not fundamentally what it was created to do. Um, and I, I think that, that that's clear at so many levels. It's, you know, it's a teacher capacity issue where there are not enough of the teachers who are willing to do whatever it takes uh, to help their kids catch up. It's a school leadership capacity issue. There aren't enough principals who are willing to do whatever it takes. It's a systems issue. These districts, in so many cases, struggle uh, to do a lot of the things that I think you know you all in this room would consider to be the basic blocking and tackling activities of trying to run large, complicated organizations. At every level, we, just, we have a problem that the school systems don't do the things or can't do the things that you would need to do if you were going to try to take this on. And I think the third thing is a prevailing ideology problem, um, for lack of a better word. And, and what I mean by that is, in, in, in my wandering of the country, and perhaps this is true of you all as well, I uh, find that most of the people I come across, civic-minded, people who show up at city club luncheons, uh, who care about the world and want to make it a better place, most of such people, at some level, basically believe this is not a solvable problem. They basically believe that poor kids cannot be educated to achieve at the same level as rich kids, and that in a pragmatic country, in a place where, in a place where we put money where it works, it's not worth investing in this problem that we've been investing in for so long without any results. And that is, I think, at its core, why we allow this to persist. Because if it weren't that way, if it were different, if it were that we thought we could just put money against this and change it, I think we would do that. Uh, because I think my experience is people don't want it to be the way it is. Uh, but in so many cases, people have had exposure to schools and they've given up. Uh, and I think that's the nature of the problem, in my view. Uh, the challenges of poverty, a school system that wasn't designed to solve that problem, and a general consensus that this is intractable and that it's not worth pumping more resources or more effort or more energy into something that doesn't seem to be getting better. And it's, I think, against this backdrop that we uh, come today to the situation we see um, uh, in education, and, uh, and it's against this backdrop that various things are uh, going on reform-wise that I think are worth highlighting. Uh, so the, the, the next thing I want to talk about is what do I think it'll take to solve this uh, problem? So at one level, uh, I think it takes solving poverty. Uh, I, think, I think that is in some ways the first answer. 
because these problems are derived from poverty, because the challenges that kids uh, have to overcome are so incredible, uh, that uh, the, the, at, at some level the solution is uh, you need to get rid of poverty. And I think that's maybe reflective of the dominant paradigm uh, in our society, that these that we're not going to be able to make progress on these things until it's no longer true that some kids go to school poor. Um, unfortunately, I think it's also true that that gets you stuck. Because uh, I think that there's, it's not obvious to me and maybe not obvious to others what exactly you do uh, if you come to the conclusion that that's what it takes. Uh, and I think that leads to freezing, it leads to inertia uh, uh, on the part of policymakers, on the part of uh, participants in the education system, on the part of uh, civic minded folks like all of us. Um, what's interesting, and at some level this has always been true, but I think it maybe is slightly more true today. Uh, there are interesting examples that we're seeing of schools and teachers uh, that are solving the problem without solving the problems of poverty. And I think that is an interesting uh, thing to dwell on for a minute. Uh, the, the first just interesting statistic to share uh, is that, um, you know, the academic, uh, there's a lot of academic research on the subject of what makes, uh, 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 what drives student achievement. And one of the more interesting findings of late is uh, a study that looked at the cumulative effects of uh, top quintile teachers and bottom quintile teachers on student achievement over time. And what it found is over three years, starting with eight-year-olds and taking people, taking students who were at the 50th percentile uh, in terms of their achievement against national norms and assigning them consecutively to top quintile teachers and bottom quintile teachers by student, uh, ranked by student, historical student achievement, uh, that after three years there is a 53 percentile point gap uh, between the two students uh, after three consecutive years of top or bottom quintile performance. That to me is extraordinary. Uh, extraordinary in the sense that it reminds us that despite all those challenges, this is actually solvable in lots of classrooms, uh, not enough, but lots, uh, lots of classrooms across the country, uh, there are teachers who bring to this the energy and the approach that it takes to take kids who are behind and dramatically change their performance in relatively short periods of time. Second thing is, uh, you all have a KIPP school here in uh, Chicago. I think they're, uh, the KIPP schools are interesting for a lot of reasons. One of the reasons they're interesting is that they're so transparent about their results. Uh, the KIPP school here in Chicago, which I think is a great school, uh, over the course of the uh, four years that it has uh, folks, uh, moves their scores up against national norms by 35 percentile points. Uh, and that's not against, uh, yes, sorry. Uh, KIPP stands for Knowledge is Power Program. It's an operator of charter schools nationally. Uh, and. Uh, you know, they're, they are a very good operator of charter schools. There are other very good operators of charter schools. These guys happen to probably be the uh, combination of biggest and best. Uh, they run about 70 schools across the country now, uh, and they uh, overwhelmingly produce dramatic results for the kids in them. Uh, uh, I'll talk in a, in a minute a little bit more about the approach there and, and what I take away as the lessons from that. But the, for, for the moment, what I'll just say is it is the case that, that uh, the KIPP school here in Chicago, KIPP Ascend, uh, increases against the national average 35 percentage points uh, over the course of the four years they have them, which is even more impressive than the stats I said a minute ago because that was uh, top quintile versus bottom quintile. This is KIPP versus average and it's 35 percentile points uh, over a few years. So I think in we're seeing examples, uh, the KIPP schools, the Lighthouse Academies, Achievement First schools, Uncommon schools, we're seeing these examples across the country uh, at the individual classroom level and at these schools levels uh, of, of places that get dramatically different results uh, than what we've come to expect. Uh, and, and, and so I think it's interesting to think about that uh, as, a, as, as raising a question for all of us about whether or not our dominant paradigm is right, uh, whether in fact this is a not solvable problem. Uh, so what do these schools and teachers do that's different, I think is an interesting question. Uh, as it gets to the question of whether this is a replicable approach to solving the problem. Uh, there's there's a, a lot they do. Let me, let me pick out a few things to just focus on. Uh, one is they go in with very high expectations. Uh, they start from the premise that this is a solvable problem. They start from the premise that every kid can achieve uh, at the high level that we have come to expect in the affluent suburbs. Uh, they come to expect that the things that uh, are holding kids back on average from achieving at that level are within our control. Uh, 
uh, and they're, they're within the control of schools. And so, you know, fundamentally to sort of reduce it to its ultimate core, they do in fact, in contrast to I think the dominant school system, they set out to solve this problem. They set out to solve the problem of how do we catch kids up, uh, the many years of progress they need to be caught up in reasonably short periods of time. Uh, second thing is they are focused on results. So in addition to having high expectations, they measure whether the kids are learning. Uh, they think of the obligation of their school as to deliver student learning as opposed to deliver good teaching. They are remarkably unfocused on questions of practice. Uh, they are all about whether or not the kids are learning and what it takes to get the kids to learn. And if they, it, you know, it's interesting sort of compared to the educational philosophy uh, throughout history, they are not dogmatic on the question of what schools should do. Uh, and they tend to change strategies actually on a pretty regular basis uh, based on whether or not the kids appear to be learning. Uh, I think that's an important characteristic of them. The third is they have a no excuses feel to them. Uh, they tend to be run by people who themselves were dramatically successful in the classroom. So they have a deep inner conviction about the solvability of the problem. They know in their hearts, because they've seen it in their own classrooms, that every kid can achieve at a high level. And therefore, they don't take any excuses from themselves about lack of achievement. They don't take any excuses from their staffs about lack of achievement. They basically start and maintain an unshakable belief in the view that this is possible and that any shortcomings in our ability to achieve it are our shortcomings and things that we should do something about. Uh, and I think that's a dominant characteristic of all of these new uh, types of schools and frankly of the best schools we see within traditional systems and the best teachers we see within traditional systems. And I think the last thing I'll point out is they are not looking for silver bullets. And I think this is important uh, because I think, you know, throughout history, uh, I think there are lots of examples within education of people looking for the magic solution to this problem. Uh, you know, and I think uh, at some level, lots of the innovations in education of is it charter schools or is it not charter schools? Is it professionally uh, managed teacher practices or is it not? I think a lot of these things have the uh, feeling of if we just do this one thing, it'll solve this problem. And what's interesting about this group of schools is their conclusions are so different. Their conclusion is it takes getting everything right. It takes getting the talent right. It takes getting the measurement right. It takes getting the goals right. It takes getting the culture right. It takes getting the ongoing management of performance right. It takes getting the curriculum right. And only when you do everything right can you really run a great organization. And I think it's interesting given that, you know, to, uh, speaking to a business crowd like this, it's so intuitive to people in the business world that of course that's the case. You do have to do everything right to create distinctive organizations. For whatever reason, I think that has not been the dominant paradigm uh, in education. But it is, I think, in this growing group of uh, incredibly high performing schools that this is about doing everything right, uh, one school and one classroom at a time. So I think the question that that raises for us is, well, what would it take to have a great teacher and a great school uh, for every kid growing up in poverty? Uh, and I think this is the, the scalability question. And so a few things. I think it takes many more great teachers. I think there are lots of great teachers out there in the world. Uh, they come from lots of different sources, but there aren't enough. Uh, it takes the teachers who are willing to take no excuses, set high expectations, do whatever it takes to help the kids catch up. It takes more of those people. It takes more people at all levels of the education system who have had this foundational experience in the classroom of being dramatically successful with their kids themselves. Uh, because those are the sorts of people who get the insights and the convictions uh, to do whatever it takes at the levels of school leadership and beyond, uh, which is what, in my view, it takes to uh, help close the achievement gap. Uh, it takes more people in every, every position in these organizations who have had that transformative experience of dramatic success. And then I think it takes, uh, you know, I've talked before about the prevailing ideology. I think it takes a shift in our prevailing ideology in, a in our country that recognizes the emerging examples of success we have, gets behind them, and pushes those things to scale. And I think if we do those things, I actually think this is fundamentally a solvable problem. Not an easy problem to solve, not a problem that gets solved by doing any quick things. Uh, but that with an enormous amount of effort and enormous amount of perseverance on the part of lots of different groups of people in lots of different ways, that this is actually fundamentally something we can take on. Uh, and I just, I, I hope that, I think building momentum uh, that I'm personally seeing in the country uh, leads to us really taking this on, because I think it's you know, pr probably the most embarrassing part of our uh, national identity, and I also think it's uh, one that's fundamentally something we can do something. Uh, 
last thing, what does Teach for America do uh, against all of this? Uh, and, uh, and what is our role in this? So in the short term, Teach for America is a source of the type of people who go above and beyond any traditional expectations and limitations uh, in the system to do whatever it takes to get their kids to achieve. Uh, they are uh, people who come from uh, selective colleges across the country. This year there are 5,000 of them. Uh, next year there'll be about 6,000. Uh, uh, Jay mentioned the places they come from. They come from uh, a lot of the familiar uh, brand name schools. Uh, uh, they come from a lot of the big state schools. Uh, and they come from uh, you know, 400 schools across the country. Um, they uh, are uh, trained by us um, in a particular approach to how to teach, uh, which is fundamentally founded in the idea that it's about outcomes, not process, uh, and that the most important thing you can do uh, to be a teacher is to figure out what your kids know already, and then after you've started teaching them something, figure out whether they learned it, and if they didn't learn it, teach it again, and if they didn't learn it that time, teach it again, and keep on going until they actually move the needle on the things they actually know and are able to do. Um, they spend uh, time in the summer before we place them uh, going through a summer training program that is one part practical of actually being in front of a classroom of kids. We run summer schools around the country, uh, learning to teach with incredibly close supervision uh, and getting to sort of uh, build the muscles, muscle memory uh, that it takes to be a great teacher, which is you know in many ways a craft as much as anything. Uh, and, uh, and then also uh, studying the uh, approach to teaching that we call teaching as leadership, which is, you know, as I said, fundamentally outcome oriented and is about figuring out what does it take to create a plan that your kids will buy into and get on the same team as you so that you can be you and them on a mission to achieve results. Uh, uh, and, and so th they go through this. Um, they are diverse. Uh, we have uh, about 30% of our core are people of color. Uh, we have about three times the representation uh, that uh, selective colleges do uh, of African Americans and about two times the representation the selective colleges do uh, of Latino uh, or Hispanic participants. That's important to us because the students we serve are uh, overwhelmingly African American or uh, Latino uh, and there's a, a whole host of reasons why we think it's important that uh, our teachers are diverse and that our movement is diverse. Um, and the evidence shows that this is working. Uh, uh, the probably most uh, rigorous study that's ever been done on Teach for America uh, was uh, done by uh, uh, independent policy group called Mathematica Policy Research, uh, which found that Teach for America folks had more impact than uh, would have been expected on the learning of their students. Um, just last week, you may all have seen the Urban Institute, a respected think tank in Washington, D.C., just came out with a study saying that the impact in high schools of a Teach for America teacher is three times uh, the impact of, uh, of uh, having a more certified uh, and experienced uh, tenured teacher. Uh, and of course, at some level, uh, this is you know not uh, the ultimate goal is not for us to have better results than certified teachers. The goal is to have on an absolute scale the results that we aspire for. Uh, but at least at some level, I think that's a good indication of, uh, of that we're making some progress on being able to help people become successful in these environments. Um, and so in the short term, that's what we're seeing, is people who come into the classroom with incredible energy and incredible talent and the willingness to take no excuses can have an impact in the short term. In the long term, what we see is coming into Teach for America, 10% of all uh, people who joined Teach for America thought they wanted to be teachers. And what ends up happening is they go into the classroom, in many cases they succeed, and they realize that in fact this is a solvable problem, and the fact that they can solve the problem in their classroom. And when they realize that this is a solvable problem, it makes them mad. Uh, and upon getting angry, it changes their lives and it changes their careers. So coming out of Teach for America, 67% stay in education for the rest of their lives. Uh, about half of those as classroom teachers, the other half as principals and superintendents and other district personnel and working in schools of education. It is a life transforming experience for the, people, for the folks who do this. Um, over time, because of the sorts of people they are, because of their potential for leadership and their capabilities, they do become leaders in all sorts of ways. Uh, there's more than 300 Teach for America principals now, despite the fact that the oldest alum has not turned 40 yet. Uh, 
uh, uh, the teacher of the year in the nation a couple years ago, Jason Camrus, uh, was a Teacher for America alum. This year there were two state winners, uh, state teacher of the year winners. So there's lots of interesting things happening in the classroom. Uh, and then at the level of uh, school leadership, you know, you all may be familiar with the new leaders for new schools program, um, which is bringing people in to teach in urban schools. Uh, teach for America people get into new leaders for new schools at five times the rate uh, of the general population. And again, there's nothing special about Teach for America per se for this, except that we are getting very talented people uh, to experience education and commit to this over time, uh, and that those people as a basis of their talent and on the basis of the conviction uh, from the experience in the classroom uh, tend to do different things than they might otherwise have done. Uh, and then the last thing I'll say is they also provide over time a fuel, a new type of fuel, I think, uh, for reshaping the prevailing ideology because you know, first of all, uh, they themselves are involved in so many of the examples of success uh, that we're seeing uh, in education right now. Uh, we were talking at our table about some of the best charter school operators, Lighthouse Schools, an excellent charter operator, and half of all of their principals are Teach for America alums. KIPP, which I mentioned before, another excellent operator of charter schools, half of all their principals are alums. Achievement First is another one of the very best, and half of all their principals are Teach for America alums. Uh, you know, we're seeing where the Teach for America folks are integrally involved in the examples of success we're seeing around the country. Uh, and then the second thing, which I think is maybe equally fascinating, is the lessons that these folks learn when they're in the classroom. So the Gallup poll does this study every year where they ask people in the general public uh, what they think the causes of the achievement gap are. And the general public says three things. Uh, lack of student motivation, lack of parental involvement, and home life issues. The three biggest causes why we have the achievement gaps we have. We, uh, as a method as a uh, you know sort of uh, test of curiosity uh, asked the same questions of teach for america core members alumni and the three and it was a list of 20 questions that the gallup poll offer 20 answers the gallup poll offers i said the top three that the general public said the what, what teach for america core members alumni say cho choosing from the same list of 20 is teacher quality principal quality and academic expectations of students uh, and i think what's fascinating about that is that the teach for america people have a list of three things that we can do something about uh, and not, you know, over 30 years by reshaping the entire country, but we can do something about now. Uh, and so it's interesting that the Teach for America folks just go through this, and they come out of this fundamentally with the attitude that this is a solvable problem, that we can solve it now, that they themselves are instruments in solving it if they commit their lives to this, if they work really hard, if they do whatever it takes, if they take no excuses. And I think that uh, that is perhaps the greatest contribution over time that Teach for America alumni are making is as, uh, as uh, energy for that. Last thing I'll say, uh, in, uh, you know, in the cities where we've been placing for a long time, Chicago is not one of them. Uh, we've been in Chicago for uh, about six or seven years, I think. Uh, but in places where we've been for a long time, uh, I'll use the District of Columbia as an example, although there are lots of others in Newark and Oakland, uh, New Orleans. Uh, you see, I think, some, di some different things happening, uh, which I personally think are very exciting. Uh, in Washington, D.C., the, the chancellor of the schools is a young woman named Michelle Ree, 37-year-old, uh, uh, tremendous talent. Uh, she happened to come through Teach for America, although we can't take too much credit for her because she was that way before we got her. Uh, but her conviction about the possibility of solving this problem, I think, is just remarkable. Uh, and she has uh, surrounded herself with a group of other uh, folks who have the same convictions, most of whom came through Teach for America, who have the same convictions about the possibility of solving this problem and are taking this on with an energy that I think is just unparalleled. Uh, even before she got there, more than 10% of all the principals in Washington, D.C. Uh, were Teach for America alums, and three people have been elected to the school board for the city. And, and I think it's an example uh, of what happens when over time more and more people experience this level of success, have this type of commitment uh, to the schools and their success over time, and begin to form begin to form a critical mass in the community. And uh, you know, I think this plays out in communities one at a time. But my hope is that over time there will be more and more of these people uh, that they will continue to be successful. Uh, they will continue to uh, have the support of the communities they operate in, uh, bringing this energy and passion uh, to seeing this level of success. Um, and uh, and um, thank you all for coming to listen. Questions. Yeah. We want short answers. Yeah. Uh, I will start off. The new system. Change is in the air already. I can feel it. 
What do you got? Are you free to five o'clock? Okay, here we go. Number one, how does one apply? What's the time frame for training and what are the qualifications for Teach, for teach America? Uh, the applications occur throughout the fall uh, on an academic calendar. So the first deadline is in September. The last deadline is in February. 90% um, of our applicants are college seniors. Uh, so that's the, it's on an academic cycle. Um, uh, and those are to teach the following fall. So we are, uh, we have just finished the last application deadline for this past year, uh, and those people will begin teaching this coming fall. Uh, there are very few qualifications uh, in the sense of like specific rules. Uh, you have to have a 2.5 GPA, uh, you have to be a US citizen, uh, but that's about it. Um, our selection process is uh, based on our uh, long-term modeling of what things lead people to be most successful in the classroom. So there are a bunch of characteristics we're looking for. They are uh, past track records of achievement, perseverance, uh, ability to influence and motivate others, uh, respect for the people and issues in low-income communities, uh, commitment to this issue over time, uh, et cetera. Uh, and we have a uh, painful interview process that we put people through uh, to make sure we get the best estimate of their capabilities as possible. The thing we're trying to solve for is whether or not they're going to actually be successful as teachers. Um, and, uh, and then we pick about the 15% of them or so, uh, even out of this impressive uh, group of applicants uh, that we think are going to be successful. Um, you know, for a lot of reasons that are probably obvious, it's very important that we only pick people who are going to be successful, both for the kids we serve today, and because if you don't succeed, you sort of learn a different set of lessons. Uh, and so we uh, try really hard to make sure we get people who are going to succeed. Uh, and then there was one last question on there. Uh, that's enough. Okay. Remember the word, the key word, the operative word is short. Okay. Uh, you know, we've got a hook. Tell us about the older TFA recruits. Where do they come from, and how do they distinguish themselves in TFA? Uh, we, while well, I said 90% of the people come uh, straight off college campuses, uh, many do not. Uh, there are um, people coming from all sorts of places. Uh, uh, people, one of the members of our board is a guy named uh, Dick Pector, who was the chairman of DLJ, the investment bank. Uh, and when he finished at DLJ, he uh, did Teach for America. So there's people like that. There's people uh, who are uh, in the communities that uh, they uh, are seeking to serve as teachers in. Uh, it's a very mixed group. Uh, they distinguish themselves in the same way, frankly, anyone else distinguishes themselves in TFA uh, by making sure that their kids learn a lot. Uh, and you know, the one thing I would note about that is, you know, people all have different attributes and different talents that they bring to this. People who come with more experience are well served leveraging that experience as part of their teaching strategy. People who come with other uh, things that take different strategies. But fundamentally, the way to distinguish yourself at TFA is making sure the kids learn a lot. Next question. How does TF TFA determine student outcomes? Test scores, overall performance, how do they do it? Uh, this is an incredibly complicated area that there is deep unsettlement in the lack of uh, uh, alignment within the educational world. My own view is I think it's not, I, I, th I personally think, you know, you, you all have probably seen these standardized tests on which these determinations are made. They're not very hard. Uh, and so kids, I, I, my view is kids who cannot pass these tests have not been served well by their educational institutions. Uh, and so as a minimum acceptable standard, we have to see progress on these basic tests of reading and math. Uh, and it's hard to access the other elements of our society if you can't uh, read and you can't do basic math. I, I think that's not sufficient. And at a higher level, I think it's much more complicated to measure performance. Uh, and we have a lot of things we do to work on that. But as a basic indicator of whether we're dealing with the problem that we are dealing with, uh, which is kids who come in many grade levels behind, uh, I think test scores actually work pretty well. Uh, Next question. Is TFA making any special effort in flood ravaged New Orleans? Uh, yes. Um, this year we are growing our core in New Orleans at the request of the leaders of the city uh, and a bunch of the national foundations from 50 to 250 people. Um, uh, and, uh, you know, if you look at New Orleans, is an interesting place in that um, it's a pretty fluid environment. Uh, lots of things are being redesigned uh, from the ground up right now in post Katrina. Uh, world and uh, what's interesting is a lot of the leaders down there are Teach for America alums. Uh, New Schools for New Orleans, which is sort of the leading institution on education reform, is led by a Teach for America alum named Sarah Houston. And I think you know if you go down to the city, a lot of the most interesting things going down on in post uh, 
flood New Orleans are Teach for America uh, integrated or uh, intertwined. Um, but yes, we are uh, hugely committed. It's one of our original replacement sites. It, it had in many ways maybe the worst school system in the country for uh, decades. Uh, and um, we think this is a great opportunity to do something better for the kids of New Orleans. Well, as we said, Paul Vallis will be here Monday from New Orleans. So, uh, you know, when you organize like this, you can just see the crispness of this. Uh, next question. Does Teach for America, well, that's a good question here. Does Teach for America abate a percentage of student loans on an annual basis? If so, how does it work? No. Uh, the federal government does have some programs for this, and Teach for America people are eligible for those federal programs. We also have a financial aid program. Uh, because we care about diversity, both socioeconomic and racial and ethnic diversity, uh, we run our own financial aid program to address the specific issues that are more prevalent there in terms of transition to career, and we give out millions of dollars in aid and uh, grants and loans. Uh, but the loan abatement is done through the federal government and is independent of us. Well, here comes the question a lot of us in education were waiting for. Quote, when comparing Chicago to other major urban centers where TFA places teacher, how much resistance do you find to allowing non-certified teachers to teach in the school system? Um, I would say that you have to group places in the country into two groups, those with teacher shortages and those without teacher shortages. Broadly speaking, in all the places with teacher shortages, there's no real resistance. Uh, because the next best option that the people are comparing Teach for America to is emergency backup. Uh, in places without teacher shortages, of which Chicago is basically one, but there are lots of others where we place Memphis and Connecticut and San Francisco and et cetera, uh, there are, the issues are just more complicated because uh, then the issue is relative performance, relative contribution over time, uh, et cetera. Um, we feel good about what the facts say about uh, what a school district should do in that situation, which is, uh, you know, I think about this as sort of a portfolio exercise, and if you're running a school system, I think you want a certain percentage of your teachers to be Teach for America type folks, uh, and then I think you also want lots of other type folks, and this is not uh, designed to crowd out all other methods of training teachers. Uh, uh, there's no evidence that, that would be a good idea, and there's also no uh, evidence that we could get enough people to do that, uh, but I think, uh, you know, our, our comfort with what the facts say notwithstanding, uh, it's still much more complicated in places with no teacher shortage. Same line follow-up question. Is Teach America working with traditional teacher preparation programs in college and universities to prepare teachers who will be successful in helping K through 12 students in high, in high need schools to catch up academically? Yes. Um, we uh, partner with a school of education in almost every community we work in, and we jointly deliver the ongoing support and training that the core members uh, get to help them become good teachers. So I think the uh, our, our delivery model is a combination of sort of the best of uh, traditional teacher education programs uh, and extracting those lessons, and the best of what we ourselves have learned over the last couple of decades about this more goal-oriented approach uh, to teaching. Um, but uh, yeah, we work in partnership in almost every community. Short question from former Senator Berman. How is Teach for America funded? 75% uh, of the money is raised in the regions where we teach to uh, support the core members that are teaching there. Uh, the national money comes from a mix of federal government, uh, national foundations, um, and national corporate partnerships. The money in the regions comes from a mix of the school districts themselves, which cover about 10% of our costs. Uh, the uh, local individuals um, who support us uh, generously, uh, local corporations and local foundations. Okay, here's a question about KIPP. I, I don't know the accuracy, but I assume this, this person is correct. KIPP uh, closed in Brownsville community, that you know where Brownsville is in Chicago, for a number of reasons, which tells us that one model does not work for all. Uh, could you comment on that? And are you promoting charter schools as the solution to poor quality education in public schools? Two-part question. Uh, let me answer the second one first. Uh, I personally am not a charter advocate. I'm not against charters either, but I generally think good schools are good schools, and, uh, and I think in general the evidence shows that charter schools are on average no better than district schools. Um, so I, my personal view is we should just be focusing on having a good schools movement and charter or non-charter sort of aside from that point. Uh, on the KIPP thing, uh, you know, KIPP is running a big machine. Uh, they have, as I said, 60-some schools around the country now. Uh, and this one in Chicago uh, is not the only one that has failed. Uh, there have been several. Uh, 
I think in general, to my estimation is that is to be expected across a system running lots of schools uh, and starting them up at a rapid rate that not every one of them is going to work. Um, I also think the KIPP model per se is not that prescriptive. I mentioned before sort of the pedagogical issues, which is that KIPP doesn't really have a point of view on what education should be. It's sort of just a results-oriented uh, uh, approach to education. And so my guess is if, if the exact same community started at another school on the same street corner uh, run by KIPP, uh, that it would, there'd be no reason to expect that it wouldn't have better results, uh, but it could also fail again. I mean, it's just these are the problems of running big systems. Um, but I don't, I, you know, again, I, I don't think there's a single solution. I think the silver bullet thing is, uh, is problematic. Uh, I just think, you know, you have to take these on with uh, people who know how to run schools and uh, people who know how to find good people to run schools and people who know how to measure results and people who know how to set curriculum and et cetera. And that has to be true in charter schools and in traditional schools and frankly in private schools serving low income communities too. I think this is just, at some level, this is an execution game. Uh, it's just about how to do a lot of things right most of the time. Two more questions. Several of them are duplicates, so we'll just get two more questions. By the way, we've gone through a whole bunch of questions. New system's working, Jay, except the reader's got to read faster here. Uh, me. What are your thoughts on Chicago Public Schools' reliance on student performance on standardized tests and the pressure it puts on both students and teachers? Um, I think the standardized test stuff is really complicated. I said before, I think at one level it's an embarrassment to all of us that kids can't pass these tests. Uh, they should be able to pass them. Um, uh, on another level, uh, you know, I think it's problematic when uh, the pressure uh, on kids um, moves from the sort of good pressure that I think a lot of us experience in our lives, that sort of good pressure to, to be a uh, uh, a high performer and to reach high expectations to sort of the pressure where you think there's actually no way to meet the expectations and it makes you crazy. Uh, and I think those tensions are really tough. Uh, uh, I don't, uh, I guess my fear is that that tension would lead one to say we should not therefore measure performance because there's a, a risk when one measures performance that, uh, that people get stressed out. My instinct is to sort of step back, accept that measuring performance is actually a sort of principle of high performing uh, organizations, and then ask ourselves the question of how do we do so in a way that creates good pressure on teachers, good pressure on kids, uh, minimizes the bad sorts of pressure. I, I, I do at some level think these are solvable problems, uh, but I recognize that they're really complicated. Last question, give you a chance to knock one out of the park here. Given the proportion of non-education degree young people entering TFA, what is the longevity of TFA teachers in the field, and do many then choose education as a career? This will be the last question to close. Okay. Uh, I, I mentioned the stats earlier. 10% coming in thinking they're going to become teachers. 67% stay in education for the rest of their lives. Those are half uh, classroom teachers and half uh, non-classroom teachers. Uh, and I think that's sort of the fundamental thing here is in the short term, taking people who will go above and beyond the traditional limitations uh, to close the gap for the kids that they're serving today, and then who will get mad from the experience, commit time and energy to this over the rest of their careers, and be part of the broader solution of leadership in the classroom, leadership beyond the classroom within education, and then leadership to affect the prevailing ideology in the country. And I think if we do that, uh, then we'll have done our part to contribute to this broader effort to uh, improve our schools. Thank you. As always, no one leaves empty handed here, uh, though not exactly a hall. We have the official City Club of Chicago mug. Thank you. We have a one year membership to the City Club of Chicago. You're welcome back here any time at all. Thank you. And we have the history of the City Club of Chicago written by uh, Jim, Jim Mariner, who, uh, former reporter, who probably would be very excited about hearing you talk about Teacher America. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, we have Paul Vallis from you know New Orleans coming on. Thanks, Jerry. Coming on uh, on on Monday, and uh, we hope to see you all here. And we still want to have Mr. Roper, who's sitting out there looking very smug, to come and address us on the business community and what's going on. And uh, yes, Jerry, if you'd like, we'll have a big picture of Assessor Houlihan for you on a dartboard. And if you if that's what takes you to come here, then that's what we'll do. We are adjourned. Thank you. Great job.